In this segment, we continue to develop a front tracking method based on advecting connected marker points. In the last lecture, we started to develop a simple front tracking method using ordered marker points. We showed how to set up the front for a closed interface representing a bubble or a drop. We found a way to identify which points on the fixed grid are closest to a given front point, and we developed a strategy to interpolate the velocities on the fixed grid to the front and move the interface points once we had their velocities. We also introduced a simple way to add and delete marker points as the distance between them changes. Here we will construct a marker function from the new location of the front and then update the code we wrote for variable density flow by replacing the density advection scheme with the front tracking. Advecting the density by moving the points that mark the position of the interface between regions of different densities is a two-step process. First we move the marker points by the fluid velocity, interpolated from the grid, and then we construct the marker field on the grid from the new location of the points. In the last lecture we move the points, and here we will create the marker and set the density. There are several ways to construct a marker function given the location of the interface, but in all cases the easiest way is to look over the interface points, find the closest points on the fixed grid, and set their values depending on whether they are on the right or left side of the front. Usually the front moves less than one grid spacing, so we only need to update points close to the interface. We generally want the marker function to transition from one value to the other in a smooth way that depends on the distance to the interface. To determine how the marker function value depends on the exact location of the interface and the distance to each grid point, we need to determine which part of the interface is closest to a given point on the fixed grid, find the distance from the interface to each point on the fixed grid, and decide how the marker value depends on the distance to the interface. We first look at the last issue. The strategy that we use here is to simply set the markers at the grid points of the fixed grid based on the distance from the interface. To decide how the marker value depends on the distance, we start with a one-dimensional example. If the front is located exactly in the middle between two grid points, say j-1 and j, then it seems reasonable that the marker value at the grid point on one side is zero and the value of the point on the other side is one. Similarly, if the front is located exactly at grid point j, then we set the value there equal to half and the values at j minus one to zero and at j plus one to one. If the front is moved further to the right, then eventually it is halfway between j and j plus one and we treat it exactly the same as in the first case, except shifted one grid point to the right. If the front is neither halfway between two grid points nor exactly at a grid point, the simplest approach is to linearly interpolate between the two cases. Thus, if dj is the distance between the front point and grid point j, and delta x is the grid spacing, then the value of the marker at grid point j is zero if dj is less than negative half the grid spacing. If d j is between the negative delta x over 2 and positive delta x over 2, then the value is half plus dj over delta x, and if dj is greater than delta x over 2, then the marker function is equal to 1. Assuming that the motion of the front is always less than a grid spacing, then we need not concern us with points further away. In two dimension, we need first of all to determine which part of the front is closest to a given grid point, and then uh, find the perpendicular distance to the interface. To make the computations of the normal as simple as possible, we will work with a segment between two front points and define the front point as the average of the two endpoints. Since what matters when we set the value at, of the grid point is the relative distance compared to the grid size, and we allow the grid spacing in x and y to be uneven, we will scale x and y distance separately by delta x and delta y. Thus, the relative distance from the red point on the front to the grid point in the lower left corner, i, j, is the square root of the square of xf minus xij divided by delta x plus the square of yf minus yij divided by delta y. The distances to the other grid points are found in the same way. To find the perpendicular distance from the front to each of the nearest grid points, we first find the normal to the front segment between front point L and L plus 1. Defining delta xf and delta yf as the difference between the endpoints of the segments, as shown in this slide, the normal is given by delta yf, comma minus delta xf divided by the length of the line segments, 
computed the square root of delta xf squared plus delta y f squared. The perpendicular relative distance between a given front point and the lower left-hand corner point on the fixed grid for point i, j, or dn1, is then equal to the projection of the distance vector onto the normal, or xf minus xi, j, divided by delta x times the x component of the normal, plus yf minus yi, j, divided by delta y times the y component of the normal. Notice that the perpendicular distance is a sign quantity that is negative on one side of the interface and positive on the other. To update the value of the marker at each grid point, we therefore set the marker to zero if the scale distance is minus a half or less, one if the distance is more than a half, and if it is in between minus a half and plus a half, we interpolate and set it equal to half plus the distance. Here we show how we set the marker value for the lower left corner of the grid cell. The values for the other three grid points are set in the same way. A code to update the marker function next to the front is all contained in one loop over the front points. First we set the scale distance from the front equal to a large value for all points of the fixed grid. This is simply an initial guess that will be updated. In the second step we find the normal vector and the midpoints of the front element. Then we compute the distance to the four grid points surrounding the front point. For each grid point we check if the distance from the front point is smaller than what has already been found. If it is smaller, we first set the marker value to either 0 or 1, depending on the sign of the perpendicular distance, and if the absolute value of the scale perpendicular distance is less than a half, we interpolate. Once the marker function has been constructed from the location of the front, we can set the various material properties as functions of the marker value. Here we assume a simple linear dependency and set the density as a marker function times density in fluid 1, where the marker is 1, plus 1 minus the marker times the density in fluid 2, where the marker is 0. In principle, we only need to update the values near the interface, but here we loop over the whole domain to simplify the programming. If we use the density as a marker function, then we obviously can skip this step. We can now modify our code and replace the simple advection equation for the density by the front cracking approach. To do so, we need to add four new parts. The first is the setup, or the initialization of the front. Then we need to interpolate the grid velocity to the front and advect the front. And after that we construct the marker function from the location of the front. Finally, we need to add and delete points at the front to keep the resolution reasonably uniform. The full code is shown in this slide where the new parts are identified by the gray background. The setup of the front is the few lines on the gray background in the first column, followed by the interpolation of the interface velocity and the advection of the interface points at the bottom. The construction of the marker function is the gray code in the middle column, and the restructuring of the front by adding and deleting points is the gray code in the third column. I know that we loop over the front both when we find the velocities at the interface points as well as when we construct the marker function. We test the new code on the same problem used already and consider a drop falling under gravity. The front and the velocity is shown at two times in the two frames on the left, and the frame on the right shows the marker at the later time using a three-dimensional view. It is clear that the marker is constant in each fluid and that the interface is reasonably thin. Since the surface tension is zero, the drop will keep deforming if we follow it further, and once it has deformed to a point where it is so thin that its thickness is comparable to the grid spacing, then obviously the marker field will deteriorate. In the absence of such problems, however, the front cracking will allow us to keep the marker and thus the density sharp for essentially all times. Constructing the marker function, or the density, given the interface, can obviously be done in several different ways. One of the main considerations is that we need to be able to treat interfaces that are very close to each other in a reasonable way. Consider the thin neck in the figure. If we looped over the interface points and set the marker function on one side of the front, at the gray point on the right, for example, to one value, and to a different value on the other side, we would find that the marker function at the grid point to the left would have one value when we move up the front and a different value when we come down the front on the other side. This is not an issue for the single drop we are working with here, so our simple approach works fine, but something to be aware of for more complex problems. A couple of techniques to deal with this issue will be reviewed later. I also note that in some cases it's beneficial to use a smoother transition shown between the fluids, and again I'll discuss that. In these lectures, we introduce a very simple front tracking code, and although it works well, it is still incomplete. We have, in particular, assumed that the viscosities of both fluids are the same and the surface tension is zero. 
In the next lectures, I will allow the viscosities to be different at surface tension and make the time integration higher order. We'll continue to focus on two-dimensional flows, since most of the concept can be explained more easily there, but extension to fully three-dimensional flows uh, are relatively straightforward.